Chapter Four of Dash for Khartoum. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter Four Back at School. It was a long time after they had, with many breaks, read edgar's letter to the end before rupert and madge could compose themselves sufficiently to accompany their father into the drawing-room they again broke down when they met their mother and it was not until captain clinton said come we must all pull ourselves together and see what is to be done and talk the whole matter over calmly that by a great effort they recovered their composure now in the first place we must try to find edgar he has got twenty-four hours start of us but that is not very much i suppose you think rupert that there is no doubt that he went up to town by the night train i have no doubt that he got away in time to do so father but of course he might have gone by the down train which passes through gloucester somewhere about the same time I do not think it likely that he did that, Rupert. I should say he was sure to go to London. That is almost always the goal people make for, unless it is in the case of boys who want to go to sea, when they would make for Liverpool or some other port. But I don't think Edgar was likely to do that. I don't think he had any special fancy for the sea, so we may assume that he has gone to London. What money had he? he had that five-pound note you sent three days ago father to clear off any ticks we had and to pay our journey home that is what he meant when he said i have taken the note but i know you won't grudge it me i think he had about a pound left that is about what i had and i know when the note came he said that the money he had was enough to last him to the end of the term so he would have the five-pound note untouched when he got to london and if driven to it he could get i should think six or seven pounds for his watch and chain that would give him enough to keep him some little time if he had been a couple of years older i should say that he would probably enlist at once as you had both made up your minds to go into the army but although lads do enlist under the proper age no recruiting officer or doctor would pass him as being eighteen the first thing to do will be to advertise for him in the first place to advertise offering a reward for information as to his whereabouts and in the second place advertising to him direct begging him to come home but he would never come father rupert said looking at the letter which captain clinton still held in his hand it would depend how we advertised suppose i were to say statement of woman not believed we are in as much doubt as before the others looked up in intense surprise oh father how could you say that rupert exclaimed oh if we could but say so i should be quite quite content to know that either of us might be her son that would not matter so much if we felt that you loved us both equally but how could you say so because rupert captain clinton said gravely i still think there is great ground for doubt do you really father oh i am pleased i think yes i am sure that i could bear now to know that edgar is your real son and not i it would be so different to learn it from your lips to know that you all love me still instead of hearing it in the dreadful way edgar did but how do you doubt father it seemed to me from reading the letter so certain do you really doubt percy mrs clinton asked i do indeed lucy and i will give you my reasons in the first place this woman left india a few weeks after the affair she certainly could not have seen the children until we returned to england and so far as we know has never seen them since if she has seen them she never can have spoken to them or come in any sort of contact with them therefore 
she cannot possibly have known which is which when she saw them at cheltenham and rupert says that she was there more than a week she met them upon every possible occasion and stared hard at them it is evident therefore that she was for all that time doubtful no doubt she was doing what we used to do trying to detect a resemblance now if we in all these years with the boys constantly watching their ways and listening to their voices could detect no resemblance it is extremely improbable that she was able to do so from merely seeing them a score of times walking in the streets i do not say that it is impossible she could have done so i only say it is extremely improbable and i think it much more likely that finding she could see no resemblance whatever she determined to speak to the first whom she might happen to find alone but there is the mark father rupert said yes there is the mark mrs clinton repeated i did not know you had a mark rupert i wonder we never noticed it lucy it is a very tiny one father i never noticed it myself indeed i can hardly see it before a glass for it is rather at the back of the shoulder until edgar noticed it one day it is not larger than the head of a good-sized pin it is a little dark brown mole perhaps it was smaller and lighter when i was a baby but it must have been there then or she would not have known about it that is so rupert but the mere fact that it is there does not in any way prove that you are our son just see what edgar says about it in his letter remember the woman could not have known which of you boys had the mark and that she did not know that is to say that she had not recognized the likeness appears from edgar's letter this is what he says she said that one of us had a small mole on the shoulder i knew that rupert had a tiny mole there and she said that was the mark by which she knew your son from hers suppose edgar had replied yes i have such a mark on my shoulder might she not have said that is the mark by which i can distinguish my son from that of captain clinton the others were silent then mrs clinton said you know percy i do not wish to prove that one more than the other of the boys is ours but naturally the woman would wish to benefit her own boy and if it had been her own boy who had the mark why should she not have told edgar that she had made a mistake and that it was rupert who was her son i do not suppose lucy that she cared in the slightest which was her son her main object of course was to extort money edgar does not say anything at all about that and of course at first she would try and make out that she was ready to sacrifice herself for him and would scarcely say that she expected him to make her a handsome allowance when he came into the property but i have no doubt that was her motive well you see she had already begun with edgar suppose she said that she had made a mistake and rupert was her son edgar would have gone in and told him and would probably have telegraphed to me so that i could get to rupert before this woman saw him and she would have known then that her story would have been upset altogether no court of law would attach any weight to what she might say she would have to stand confessed as having been concerned in a gross fraud and with having lied at first and unless she was in a position to produce corroborative evidence to prove that her child had this mark her word would go for nothing now i feel sure that she could produce no such evidence the mark was almost an invisible one for it was never afterwards noticed had she shown it to any of the women of her acquaintance they would have come forward when the change of children took place and have pointed out that the children could be easily distinguished inasmuch as my child had a peculiar mark i feel sure that even her husband knew nothing about this mark for i don't believe he was a party to the fraud he was terribly upset by the whole business and took to drink afterwards there were continual quarrels between his wife and himself and she left him and went to england i believe if he could have pointed out which was my child and which was his own he would have done so 
certainly i myself should have attached little or no weight to this woman's story if she had come here with it i should have turned her out of the house and have told her to go to a court if she dare and claim the custody of her son she must have known the weakness of her own position and as i say having once opened the matter to edgar she determined to stick to it knowing that a boy taken thus on a sudden would be likely to believe her whereas if she said that you were her son she would find you already prepared and probably have to confront me too so you see rupert i can truthfully advertise woman's story not believed we are in as much doubt as before both are regarded by us as our sons i am glad father rupert exclaimed excitedly oh if edgar had but written to you first instead of going straight away it would have been better captain clinton said but i cannot blame him i think it was natural that he should go as he did he would have thought that had he written to me it would have seemed as if he wanted something from me and anything would have seemed better to him than that however we must set about doing something at once i shall go by the nine o'clock local to swindon and on by the night train to town then i shall set a detective at work he may find out from the porters if any one noticed a lad arrived by the night mail this morning and shall draw up carefully worded advertisements i shall write to mr river smith before i start what would you like rupert to go back to-morrow or to stay away until the end of the term if you take my advice you will go back it would be a pity for you to miss your examinations i don't think i could get through the examinations father with this on my mind besides what should i say to the fellows about edgar's going away you see if we find him before next term begins we need say nothing about it you would have to account for his having run away rupert anyhow i think you had better go back my boy and tell the facts of the story there is not the slightest discredit in it and it would be better for edgar himself that it should be known that he went under the influence of a mistake than that all sorts of reasons should be assigned for his absence there will of course be no occasion to go into full details you would tell the story of the confusion that arose as to the children and say that edgar had received some information which led him erroneously to conclude that the problem was solved and that he was not my son and that therefore he had run away as to avoid receiving any further benefits from the mistake that had been made perhaps that would be best father indeed i don't know what i should do if i were to stop here now with nothing to do but to worry about him i am sure it will be best rupert i will tell your master you will return to-morrow afternoon captain clinton went up to town by the night mail and in the morning went to a private detective's office after giving particulars of edgar's age and appearance he went on as he had no luggage with him and there was nothing particular about his personal appearance i consider it altogether useless to search for him in london but i think it possible that he may try to enlist sixteen is too young for them to take him unless he looks a good deal older than he is yes i quite see that at the same time that is the only thing that occurs to us as likely for him to try not likely to take to the sea sir not at all likely from what we know of his fancies still he might do that for a couple of years with a view to enlisting afterwards how about going to the states or canada that again is quite possible had he money with him sir he had about five pounds in his pocket and a gold watch and chain that he had only had a few months and could i should think get seven or eight pounds for but i do not see what he could do to get his living if he went abroad no sir but then young gents always have a sort of fancy that they can get on well out there and if they do not mind what they turn to i fancy that most of them can is he in any trouble sir you will excuse my asking but a young chap who gets into trouble generally acts in a different sort of way to one who has gone out what we may call venturesome 
no he has got into no trouble captain clinton said he has gone away under a misunderstanding but there is nothing whatever to make him wish to conceal himself beyond the fact that he will do all he can to prevent my tracing him at present here are half a dozen of his photos if you want more i can get them struck off i could do with another half dozen the man said i will send them down to men who act with me at southampton hull liverpool glasgow and plymouth and will send two or three abroad he might cross over to bremen or hamburg a good many go that way now i will look after the recruiting offices here myself but as he is only sixteen and as you say does not look older i do not think there is a chance of his trying that no recruiting sergeant would take him up no sir i should say that if he has no friends he can go to the chances are he will try to ship for the states or canada but what are we to do if we find him captain clinton had not thought of this of course the man went on if you gave an authority for me to send down to each of my agents they could take steps to stop him no captain clinton said after a pause during which he had been thinking that as he could not swear that edgar was his son he was in fact powerless in the matter no i do not wish that done i have no idea whatever of coercing him i want if possible to see him and converse with him before he goes if that is not possible and if he is not found until just as the ship is sailing then i want your agent to wire me the name of the steamer in which he goes and the port to which it sails then if there is a faster steamer going i might be there as soon as he is if not i should wish you to telegraph to a private detective firm across the water which i suppose you could do to have somebody to meet the steamer as she came in and without his knowing it to keep him under his eye until i arrive i could manage all that sir easily enough i will send off four of the photographs at once to the ports and the others as soon as i get them and will go down with the other photograph to the recruiting office and arrange with one of the sergeants engaged there to let me know if he turns up and will send a man down to the docks to watch the ships there i will send off the other photos directly i get them there was nothing else for captain clinton to do but before he returned home he wrote out a series of advertisements and left them at the offices of the principal papers they ran as follows if e c who left cheltenham suddenly will return home he will find that he has acted under a misapprehension the woman's story was untrustworthy he is still regarded as a son by p c and l c having done this he drove to paddington and went down by an afternoon train rupert arrived at cheltenham just as the others had sat down to tea hello clinton back again eh glad to see you rupert nodded a reply to the greeting his heart was too full to speak and he dropped into the seat he was accustomed to use the others moving up closely to make room for him a significant glance passed between the boys they saw that edgar was not with him and guessed that there was something wrong there had been a good deal of wonder among them at the clinton's sudden disappearance and although several of the boys had seen rupert go into his brother's dormitory none had seen edgar and somehow or other it leaked out that rupert had started in a cab to the station alone there had been a good deal of quiet talk among the seniors about it all agreed that there was something strange about the matter especially as robert when questioned on the subject had replied that mr river smith's orders were that he was to say nothing about it as a precautionary measure orders were given to the juniors that no word about the clinton's absence was to be said outside the house after tea was over rupert went up to pinkerton pinkerton i should like to have a talk with you and easton and two or three others skinner and mossop and templer yes and scudamore just as you like clinton of course if you like to tell us anything we shall be glad to hear it but we all know that your brother was not the sort of fellow to get into any dishonourable sort of scrape 
and i can promise you we shall ask no questions if you would rather keep the matter altogether to yourself no i would rather tell you rupert said i know none of you would think that edgar would have done anything wrong but all sorts of stories are certain to go about and i would rather that the truth of the matter were known you are the six head fellows of the house and when i have told you the story you can do as you like about its going further well if you go up to my study pinkerton said i will bring the others up in three or four minutes the party were gathered there look here clinton easton said pinkerton says he has told you that we are all sure that whatever this is all about your brother has done nothing he or you need be ashamed about i should like to say the same thing and if it is painful for you to tell it do not say anything about it we shall be quite content to know that he has left if he has left although i hope we shall see him again next term for some good reason or other no i would rather tell it rupert said it is a curious story and a very unpleasant one for us but there is nothing at all for us to be ashamed about and he went on to tell them the whole story ending with you see whether edgar or i am the son of captain clinton or of this sergeant and his scheming wife is more than we can say it does not matter a bit to us easton said breaking the silence of surprise with which they had listened to the story we like you and your brother for yourselves and it does not matter a rap to us nor as far as i can see to any one else who your fathers and mothers were i call it horribly hard lines for you both skinner put in deuced hard lines especially for your brother pinkerton said by what you say captain clinton and his wife don't care now which is their real son one is real and the other adopted and as they regard you in the same light they don't even want to know which is which well now you know that it seems to me you are all right anyhow you see your brother didn't know that and when this woman told him she was his mother and that the whole thing had been a preconcerted plot on her part i can quite understand his going straight away i think we should all have done the same if we had had the same story told to us and had seen we were intended to be parties to a fraud of that sort well i am glad you told us but i do not think there is any occasion for the story to go further certainly not easton agreed it would do no good whatever and of course it would never be kept in the house but would come to be the talk of the whole school all that need be said is that clinton has told us the reason of his brother leaving so suddenly that we are all of opinion that he acted perfectly rightly in doing so and that nothing more is to be said about the matter we will each give clinton our word of honor not to give the slightest hint to any one about it or to say that it is a curious story or anything of that sort but just to stick to it that we have heard all about it and are perfectly satisfied that will certainly be the best plan pinkerton agreed but i think it would be as well for us to say he has left for family reasons and that it is nothing in any way connected with himself and that we hope that he will be back again next term yes we might say that easton agreed family reasons mean all sorts of things and any one can take their choice out of them well clinton i shouldn't worry over this more than you can help i dare say edgar will be found in a day or two at any rate you may be sure that no harm has come to him or is likely to come to him if he emigrates or anything of that sort he is pretty safe to make his way and i am sure that whatever he is doing he will always be a gentleman and a good fellow that he will mossop said cordially i hope we should all have done as he has under the same circumstances but it would be a big temptation to some fellows to have the alternative of a good fortune and a nice estate on one side and of going out into the world and making your own living how you can on the other there was a chorus of assent yes easton said it is very easy to say do what is right and never mind what comes of it 
but we should all find it very hard to follow it in practice if we had a choice like that before us well you tell your brother when you hear of him clinton that we all think better of him than before and that whether he is a sergeant's son or a captain's we shall welcome him heartily back and be proud to shake his hand and so it was settled and to the great disappointment of the rest of the house no clue was coming forth as to the cause of edgar clinton leaving so suddenly but as the monitors and seniors all seemed perfectly satisfied with what they had heard it was evident to the others that whatever the cause might be he was not to blame in the matter during the short time that remained of the term rupert got on better than he had expected while the examination was going on easton invited him to do his work in his private study gave him his advice as to the passages likely to be set and coached him up in difficult points and he came out higher in his form than he had expected to do three days before the school broke up easton said clinton i have had a letter from my father this morning and he will be very glad if you will come down to spend the holidays at our place and so shall i there is very good hunting round us my father has plenty of horses in his stables and i expect we shall be rather gay for my brother comes of age in the week after christmas and there is going to be a ball and so on i don't know how you feel about it but i should say that it would be better for you than being at home where everything will call your brother to your mind and your being there will make it worse for the others i am very much obliged to you easton i should like it very much i will write off to the governor at once and hear what he says they might like to have me home and possibly i might be useful in the search for edgar as i have told you i feel sure that he has enlisted he would be certain to change his name and it would be no use any one who did not know him going to look at the recruits but we agreed clinton that no one would enlist him at his age and he is altogether too old to go as a band boy yes i know that and that is what worries me more than anything still i cannot help thinking that he will try somehow to get into the army if he can't i believe he will do anything he can to get a living until they enlist him i don't think he can anyhow pass as eighteen clinton if it was for anything else he might get up with false mustache or something but you see he has got to pass a strict examination by a surgeon i have heard that lots of fellows do enlist under age but then some fellows look a good bit older than they are i don't believe any doctor would be humbugged into believing that edgar is anything like eighteen well i will write to my father this afternoon and hear what he says if he thinks i cannot do any good and they don't want me at home i shall be very pleased to come to you captain clinton's letter came by return of post he said that he was very pleased rupert had had an invitation that would keep him away we have received no news whatever of edgar and i don't think that it would be of any use for you to join in the search for him there is no saying where he may have gone or what he may be doing i agree with you that he will most likely take any job that offers to keep him until he can enlist arrangements have been made with one of the staff sergeants at the headquarters of recruiting in london to let us know if any young fellow answering to edgar's description comes up to be medically examined so we shall catch him if he presents himself there unfortunately there are such a number of recruiting depots all over the country that there is no saying where he may try to enlist that is if he does try however at present there is certainly nothing you can do i should like to have you home and your mother says she should like you too but i do think that for her sake it is better you should not come as long as you are away there is nothing to recall at every moment the fact that edgar has gone whereas if you were here his absence would be constantly before her she is quite ill with anxiety and dr wilkinson agrees with me that change is most desirable i am sure she would not hear of going away if you were at home it would give her a good excuse for staying here but when she hears that you are not coming 
i think i may be able to persuade her to listen to wilkinson's opinion and in that case i shall take her and madge down to nice at once if i can get her there by christmas so much the better for christmas at home would be terribly trying to us all once we are there we can wander about for two or three months in italy or spain or across to algeria or egypt anything to distract her mind accordingly rupert accepted easton's invitation and went with him to his father's in leicestershire had it not been for the uncertainty about edgar he would have enjoyed his holidays greatly although he had always joined to a certain extent in the chaff of his schoolfellows at easton's care about his dress and little peculiarities of manner he had never shared in skinner's prejudices against him and always said that he could do anything well that he chose to turn his hand to and had appreciated his readiness to do a kindness to any one who really needed it it had been his turn now and the friendly companionship of the older boy had been of the greatest value to him easton had never said much in the way of sympathy which indeed would have jarred rupert's feelings but his kindness had said more than words could do and rupert as he looked back felt ashamed at the thought that he had often joined in a laugh about him at home the points that had seemed peculiar at school were unnoticeable the scrupulous attention to dress that had there been in strong contrast to the general carelessness of the others in that respect seemed but natural in his own house where there were a good many guests staying rupert and edgar had always been more particular at home than at school but easton was the same indeed rupert thought that he was if anything less particular now than he had been at river smith's a week after christmas rupert received a letter from his father written at nice saying that a letter from edgar had been forwarded on from home and giving the brief words in which the lad said that he was well and that they might be under no uneasiness respecting him this does not tell us much captain clinton went on but we are very pleased inasmuch as it seems that edgar does not mean altogether to drop out of our sight but will we hope write from time to time to let us know that at any rate he is well the letter has the london postmark but of course that shows nothing it may have been written anywhere and sent to any one perhaps to a waiter at a hotel at which he stopped in london and with whom he had arranged to post any letters that he might enclose to him the letter has greatly cheered your mother who in spite of all i could say has hitherto had a dread that edgar in his distress might have done something rash i have never thought so for an instant i trust that my two boys are not only too well principled but too brave to act a coward's part whatever might befall them your mother of course agreed with me in theory but while she admitted that edgar would never if in his senses do such a thing urged that his distress might be so great that he would not be responsible for what he was doing happily this morbid idea has been dissipated by the arrival of the letter and i have great hopes now that she will rouse herself and will shake off the state of silent brooding which has been causing me so much anxiety it was but this morning that we received the letter and already she looks brighter and more like herself than she has done since you brought us the news of edgar's disappearance this news enabled rupert to enjoy the remainder of the holidays much more than he had done the first fortnight he and edgar had both been accustomed to ride since they had been children and had in their christmas holidays for years accompanied their father to the hunting field at first upon ponies but the previous winter on two lightweight carrying horses he had bought specially for them mr easton had several hunters and rupert who was well mounted thoroughly enjoyed the hunting and returned to school with his nerves braced up ready for work i won't say anything against easton again skinner said when he heard from rupert how pleasant his holidays had been made for him i noticed how he took to you and made things smooth for you the last ten days of the term and i fully meant to tell him 
that i was sorry i had not understood him better before only in the first place i never happened to have a good opportunity and in the second place i don't know that i ever tried to make one however i shall tell him now it is not a pleasant thing to be obliged to own that you have behaved badly but it is a good deal more unpleasant to feel it and not have the pluck to say so accordingly the next time easton came into the senior study skinner went up to him and said easton i want to tell you that i am uncommonly sorry that i have set myself against you because you have been more particular about your dress and things than the rest of us and because you did not seem as keen as we were about football and things i know that i have behaved like an ass and i should like to be friends now if you will let me certainly i will skinner easton said taking the hand he held out i don't know that it was altogether your fault my people at home are rather particular about our being tidy and that sort of thing and when i came here and some of you rather made fun of me about it i think that i stuck to it all the more because it annoyed you i shall be going up for sandhurst this term and i am very glad to be on good terms with all you fellows before i leave so don't let us say anything more about it and with another shake of the hands their agreement to be friends was ratified the term between christmas and easter was always the dullest of the year the house matches at football were over although a game was sometimes played there was but a languid interest in it paper chases were the leading incident in the term and there was a general looking forward to spring weather when cricket could begin and the teams commence practice for the matches of the following term easton was going up in the summer for the examination for the line he was not troubling himself specially about it and indeed his getting in was regarded as a certainty for mr southley had said that he would be safe for the indian civil if he chose to try and considered it a great pity that he was going up for so comparatively an easy competition as that for the line he occasionally went for a walk with rupert and while chatting with him frequently about edgar was continually urging him not to let his thoughts dwell too much upon it but to stick to his work the watch at the various ports had long since been given up for had edgar intended to emigrate he would certainly have done so very shortly after his arrival in london as his means would not have permitted him to make any stay there i think it is very thoughtful of edgar easton said one day when rupert told him that he had heard from his father that another letter had arrived so many fellows when they run away or emigrate or anything of that sort drop writing altogether and do not seem to give a thought to the anxiety those at home are feeling for them he is evidently determined that he will go his own way and accept no help from your people and under the circumstances i can quite enter into his feelings but you see he does not wish them to be anxious or troubled about him and i don't think there is anything for you to worry about clinton he may be having a hardish time of it still he is in no doubt getting his living somehow or other and i don't know that it will do him any harm i think he is the sort of fellow to make his way in whatever line he takes up and though what he has learnt here may not be of much use to him at the start his having had a good education is sure to be of advantage to him afterwards a fellow who could hold his own in a tussle such as we had with the greenites last term can be trusted to make a good fight in anything at any rate it is of no use your worrying yourself about him you see you will be going up in a year's time for your examination for the line and you will have to stick to it pretty steadily if you are to get through at the first trial it won't help matters your worrying about him and wherever he is and whatever he is doing he is sure to keep his eye on the lists and he will feel just as much pleasure in seeing your name there as he would have done if he had been here with you so i should say work steadily and play steadily you have a good chance of being in the college boat next term that and shooting will give you enough to do 
it is no use sticking to it too hard i was telling skinner yesterday he will regularly addle his brain if he keeps on grinding as he is doing now but it is of no use talking to skinner when his mind is set on a thing he can think of nothing else last term it was football now it is reading it must be an awful nuisance to be as energetic as he is i cannot see why he should not take life comfortably he would say rupert laughed he cannot see why he should do things by fits and starts as you do easton ah but i do not do it on principle easton argued i am all for taking it quietly only sometimes one gets stirred up and has to throw oneself into a thing one does it you know but one feels it a nuisance an unfair wear and tear of the system your system does not seem to suffer seriously easton no but it might if one were called upon to do these things often but it is time for us to turn back or we shall be late for tea end of chapter four dash for khartoum chapter five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 5. Enlisted. Edgar had found but little difficulty in getting out from the house. He had timed himself so as to arrive at the station just before the train left for Gloucester, and taking his ticket, had slipped into an empty carriage. At Gloucester, there was half an hour to wait before the up train came in this time he got into a carriage with several other people he did not want to spend the night thinking and as long as his fellow passengers talked he resolutely kept his attention fixed on what they were saying then when one after the other composed themselves for a sleep he sat with his eyes closed thinking over his school days he had already while he lay tossing on his bed, thought over the revelation he had heard from every point of view. He had exhausted the subject and would not allow his thoughts to return to it. He now fought the football match of the Greenites over again in fancy. It seemed to him that it was an event that had taken place a long time back, quite in the dim distance, and he was wondering vaguely over this when he too fell asleep and did not wake up until the train arrived at Paddington. It was with a feeling of satisfaction that he stepped out onto the platform. Now there was something to do. It was too early yet to see about lodgings. He went to a little coffee-house that was already open for the use of the workmen, had some breakfast there, and then walked about for two or three hours until London was astir, leaving his things at the coffee-house. Then he went to a pawnbroker's and pawned his watch and chain. Then, having fetched his things from the coffee-house, he went into the Edgeware Road and took an omnibus down to Victoria, and then walked on across Vauxhall Bridge and set to work to look for lodgings. He was not long in finding a bedroom to let, and here he installed himself. He was convinced Captain Clinton would have a vigilant search made for him but he thought that he was now fairly safe, however sharp the detectives might be in their hunt for him. He felt deeply the sorrow there would be at home, for he knew that up to now he and Rupert had been loved equally, and that even the discovery that he had had no right to the care and kindness he had received would make no great difference in their feeling towards him had the change of children been really the result of accident he would not have acted as he had done he himself had had no hand in the fraud but were he to accept anything now from captain clinton he felt that he would be an accessory to it had not his mother his own mother proposed that he should take part in the plot that he should go on deceiving them and even that he should rob rupert altogether of his inheritance it was too horrible to think of there was nothing for it that he could see 
but for him to go out utterly from their lives and to fight his way alone until he could at any rate show them that he needed nothing and would accept nothing he was dimly conscious himself that he was acting unkindly and unfairly to them and that after all they had done for him they had a right to have a say as to his future but at present his pride was too hurt he was too sore and humiliated to listen to the whisper of conscience and his sole thought was to hide himself and to make his own way in the world lest his resolution should be shaken he carefully abstained from a perusal of the papers lest his eye might fall upon an advertisement begging him to return his mind was made up that he would enlist he knew that at present he could not do so as a private but he thought that he might be accepted as a trumpeter he thought it probable that they would guess that such was his intention and would have given a description of him at the recruiting offices it was for this reason that he determined to live as long as he could upon his money before trying to enlist as if some time elapsed he would be less likely to be recognized as answering the description that might be given by captain clinton than if he made the attempt at once from vauxhall he often crossed to westminster and soon struck up an acquaintance with some of the recruiting sergeants want to enlist eh one of them said i am thinking of entering as a trumpeter well you might do that there are plenty of younger lads than you are trumpeters in the cavalry i will look at the list and see what regiments have vacancies but i doubt whether they will take you without a letter from your father saying that you are enlisting with his consent i have no father that i know of edgar said well then it is likely they will want a certificate from a clergyman or your schoolmaster as to character and i expect the sergeant said shrewdly you would have a difficulty in getting such a paper edgar nodded well lad if you have quite made up your mind about it my advice would be do not try here in london they are a lot more particular than they are down in the country and i should say you are a good deal more likely to rub through at aldershot or canterbury than you would be here they are more particular here you see they have no great interest in filling up the ranks of a regiment while when you go to the regiment itself the doctors and officers and all of them like seeing it up to its full strength so their interest is to pass a recruit if they can i have known scores and hundreds of men rejected here tramp down to aldershot or take the train if they had money enough in their pockets to pay the fare and get past without a shadow of difficulty i would rather not enlist for the next month or two edgar said there might be somebody asking after me if you will take my advice lad you will go back to your friends there are many young fellows run away from home but most of them are precious sorry for it afterwards i am not likely to be sorry for it sergeant and if i am i shall not go back do you think i could find any one who would give me lessons on the trumpet i should say that there would not be any difficulty about that there is nothing you cannot have in london if you have got money to pay for it if you were to go up to albany barracks and get hold of the trumpet major he would tell you who would teach you he would not do it himself i dare say but some of the trumpeters would be glad to give you an hour a day if you can pay for it of course it would save you a lot of trouble afterwards if you could sound the trumpet before you joined edgar took the advice and found a trumpeter in the blues who agreed to go out with him for an hour every day on to primrose hill and there teach him to sound the trumpet he accordingly gave up his room at vauxhall and moved across to the north side of regent's park for six weeks he worked for an hour a day with his instructor who upon his depositing a pound with him as a guarantee for its return borrowed a trumpet for him and with this edgar would start of a morning and walking seven or eight miles into the country spend hours in eliciting the most mournful and startling sounds from the instrument at the end of the six weeks his money was nearly gone although he had lived most economically 
and accordingly after returning the trumpet to his instructor who although he had been by no means chary of abuse while the lessons were going on now admitted that he had got on first rate he went down to aldershot where his friend the recruiting sergeant had told him that they were short of a trumpeter or two in the first hussars it was as well that edgar had allowed the two months to pass before endeavouring to enlist for after a month had been vainly spent in the search for him rupert had suggested to his father that although too young to enlist in the ranks edgar might have tried to go in as a trumpeter and inquiries had been made at all the recruiting depots whether a lad answering to his description had so enlisted the sergeant had given him a note to a sergeant of his acquaintance in the hussars i put it pretty strong young un his friend had said when he gave him the note mind you stick to what i say the sergeant had indeed incited partly perhaps by a liking for the lad partly by a desire to return an equivalent for the sovereign with which edgar had presented him drawn somewhat upon his imagination i have known the young chap for a very long time he said his father and mother died years ago and though i am no relation to him he looks upon me as his guardian as it were he has learned the trumpet a bit and will soon be able to sound all the calls he will make a smart young soldier and will i expect take his place in the ranks as soon as he is old enough do the best you can for him and keep an eye on him i will take you round to the trumpet major the sergeant said he had better go with you to the adjutant you know what sergeant mcbride says in this letter no i don't know exactly what he says he told me he would introduce me to you and that you would he was sure do your best to put me through well you had better hear what he does say it is always awkward to have misunderstandings he says you have lost your father and mother you understand that that's right edgar said quietly and that he has known you for a very long time edgar nodded it seems to me a very long time he added and that though he is no actual relation of yours he considers he stands in the light of your guardian that is important you know i will remember that edgar said there is certainly no one as far as i know who has a better right than sergeant mcbride to advise me or give me permission to enlist well you stick to that and you are all right now come along i wonder who the young chap is the sergeant said to himself as they crossed the barrack yard as to what mcbride said we know all about that i have been on the recruiting staff myself but i think the young un was speaking the truth he has lost his father and mother he has known mcbride for some time and he has got no one who has any right to interfere with him rum too the boy is a gentleman all over though he has rigged himself out in those clothes well we are short of trumpeters and i don't suppose the adjutant will inquire very closely the trumpet major was quite willing to do his share of the business he was glad to fill up one of the vacancies especially as it seemed that the newcomer would soon be able to take his place in the ranks and after asking a few questions he went across with him to the adjutant the latter looked at edgar critically smart young fellow he said to himself got into some scrap at home i suppose and run away of course he has some got-up lie ready well sergeant what is it lad wishes to enlist as a trumpeter sir here is a letter from his next friend sergeant mcbride of the eighteenth hussars lad's father and mother dead mcbride stands in place of guardian a likely story the adjutant muttered to himself what is your name lad i enlist as edward smith edgar said age sixteen parents dead i lost them when i was a child sir who were they my father was a sergeant in the thirtieth foot sir the adjutant was watching him narrowly either he is telling the truth he said to himself or he is one of the calmest young liars i have ever come across and there is no one who has any legal right to control you or to object to your enlisting no one sir you cannot play i suppose i have been learning the trumpet for some little time sir and can sound a few of the calls 
"'Well, I suppose that will do, Sergeant. You had better take him across to the doctor. If he passes him, put him up for the night, and bring him here tomorrow at twelve o'clock to be sworn in.' "'Rather a tough case, that,' he said to himself, as the trumpet major left with the young recruit. "'There is not a doubt the boy is lying, and yet I could have declared he was speaking the truth. Of course, he may be the son of a non-commissioned officer, and have been brought up and educated by someone. He looks a gentleman all over, and speaks like one. Well, it is no business of mine, and the adjutant gave the matter no further thought. The next day Edgar was sworn in. The colonel, hearing from the adjutant that he had questioned the boy, and that there was no impediment to his enlisting, passed him without a remark, and Edgar was at once taken to the regimental tailor and measured for his uniform, and half an hour later was marched out with four or five of the other trumpeters beyond the confines of the camp, and was there set to work at the calls. His work was by no means light. He was at once sent into the riding school, and found it a very different thing to satisfy the riding master and his sergeants than it had been to learn to sit a horse at home. However, his previous practice in that way rendered the work much easier for him than it would otherwise have been, and he was not very long in passing out from the squad of recruits. Then he had two or three hours a day of practice with the trumpet, an hour a day at gymnastics, and in the afternoon two hours of school. The last item was, however, but child's play, and as soon as the instructor saw that the lad could without difficulty take a first class, he employed him in aiding to teach others. The evening was the only time he had to himself. Then, if he chose to take the trouble to dress, he could go out into the town, or stroll through the camp, or take a walk. If disinclined for this, there was the cavalry canteen, with a large concert room attached, where entertainments were given by music-hall singers brought down from London. The trumpeters and bandsmen had a barrack room to themselves. Edgar, who had a healthy appetite, found the food of a very different description to that which he had been accustomed. Although up at six o'clock in the morning, even in the winter, as it was, there was nothing to eat until eight. Then there was a mug of a weak fluid called tea and an allowance of bread. The dinner, which was at one, consisted of an amount of meat scarcely sufficient for a growing boy, for although had the allowance consisted entirely of flesh it would have been ample, it was so largely reduced by the amount of bone and fat that the meat was reduced to a minimum. However, when eked out with potatoes and bread, it sufficed well enough. Tea at six consisted, like breakfast, of a mug of tea and bread. Edgar found, however, that the Spartan breakfasts and teas could be supplemented by additions purchased at the canteen. Here, pennyworths of butter, cheese, bacon, an egg, a herring, and many similar luxuries were obtainable, and two pence of his pay was invariably spent on breakfast, a penny sufficing for the addition to his tea. He found that he soon got on well with his comrades. It was like going to a fresh school. There was at first a good deal of rough chaff, but as soon as it was found that he could take this good-temperedly, and that if pushed beyond a fair limit he was not only ready to fight, but was able to use his fists with much more science than any of the other trumpeters, he was soon left alone, and indeed became a favorite with the bandsmen. Two months after he joined, he was appointed to a troop. He found, however, that he did not have to accompany them generally on parade. The regiment, like all others at home, was very short of its complement of horses, and only one trumpeter to each squadron was mounted. Edgar, however, cared little for this. He considered his first two years' work as merely a probation which had to be gone through before he could take his place in the ranks as a trooper. He found his pay sufficient for his needs. Although he had in the old days been in the habit of drinking beer, he had made a resolution to abstain from it altogether on joining the regiment. He determined to gain his stripes at the earliest possible opportunity, and knew well enough 
from what he had heard captain clinton say that drink was the curse of the army and that men although naturally sober and steady were sometimes led into it and thereby lost all chance of ever rising he had never smoked and it was no privation to him to abstain from tobacco and he had therefore the whole of his pay after the usual deduction for stoppages at his disposal for food and had always a little in his pocket to lend to any comrade who had the bad luck to be put on heavy stoppages by the loss of some of his necessaries in this respect he himself suffered somewhat heavily at first accustomed at school to leave his things carelessly about without the slightest doubt as to their safety he was astonished and shocked to find that a very much laxer code of morality prevailed in the army and that any necessaries left about instantly disappeared the first week after joining he lost nearly half the articles that had been served out to him and was for some months on heavy stoppages of pay to replace them the lesson however had its effect and he quickly learnt to keep a sharp lookout over his things he was soon dismissed from school obtaining his first class at the examination which took place two months after he joined and this gave him time to attend the fencing school and to give more time to gymnastics when once accustomed to his work he found his life an easy and pleasant one and had far more time at his disposal than had been the case at school he resolutely avoided dwelling on the past and whenever he found himself thinking of what had so long been home he took up a book or went out for a walk or engaged in some occupation that served to distract his thoughts he missed the games football was occasionally played but there was no observance of rules and after trying it once or twice he gave it up in disgust he often joined in a game at fives and practised running and jumping so as to be able to take part in the regimental sports in the spring when easter had passed and the weather became bright and pleasant he often took long walks alone for it was seldom he could find any one willing to accompany him he had learnt drawing at cheltenham and as he found that it would be useful for him when he obtained the rank of a non-commissioned officer to make sketches and maps to send in with reports of any country reconnoitred he accustomed himself to do this on his walks jotting down the features of the country noticing the spots where roads came in the width of the bridges across the canals and the nature of their banks and taking sketches of what appeared to him positions that would be occupied to check a pursuing force or to be taken up by an advanced one at this time too he joined a class for signalling and found it highly interesting and before the end of the summer could send a message or read one with flags or flashlights as soon as the summer really began he took to cricket and here he speedily attracted the attention of the officers he had been the best bowler in the second eleven and would have been in the first the next season at cheltenham but it was some little time before his proficiency as a bowler became known although it was soon seen that his batting was far above the average that youngster handles his bat well moffat one of the lieutenants said to the captain who was the most energetic cricketer among the officers and who with one or two of the sergeants generally made up the team when the regimental eleven played against that of other corps yes he plays in good form doesn't he who is the young fellow at the wicket now sergeant he is trumpeter of d troop sir he only joined three months ago but he could play a bit when he came and got posted to a troop before two others who joined four or five months before him the man who is bowling now is not up to much sergeant suppose you take the ball for an over or two i should like to see how that young fellow would stand up to your bowling the sergeant who was one of the regimental bowlers took the ball edgar who had been driving the previous bowler in all directions at once played carefully and for an over or two contented himself with blocking the balls then one came a little wide and he cut it to leg for four captain moffat took off his coat and waistcoat 
and took the end facing the sergeant and began to bowl some slow twisting balls that were in strong contrast to the fast delivery of the sergeant edgar felt now that he was being tried and played very cautiously there were no runs to be made off such bowling until the bowler became careless or tired at last a ball came rather farther than usual edgar stepped out to meet it and drove it nearly straight forward and scored four and it was not until his score ran up to thirty that he was at last caught you will do smith captain moffat said approvingly where did you learn to play cricket i learned at school sir ah well they taught you that well if they taught you nothing else you go on practising and i will give you a chance to play for the regiment the first time that there is a vacancy two or three matches were played before the chance came then sergeant stokes the bowler hurt his hand the day before they were going to play the rifle brigade which was considered the strongest team in camp this is an unlucky business sergeant captain moffat said to him as they were talking over next day's play i thought if we had luck we might make a good fight with the rifles bowling is never our strongest point and now you are out of it we shall make a very poor show are there any of the men outside the eleven who show any bowling talent the sergeant shook his head not one of them sir i hoped corporal holland would have made a bowler but he seems to have gone off rather than come on no we must trust to the bowlers we have got there are four or five of them who are not bad though except yourself sir there is nothing so to speak to depend on you cannot depend on me sergeant there is no certainty about my bowling sometimes i do pretty fairly at other times i get hit all over the field no my proper place is wicket-keeping i should never leave that if we had two or three bowlers we could depend upon well we must go in for run-making i do not think that we can do better than put on that young trumpeter till you can play again i have watched him several times at practice and he always keeps his wickets up well and hits freely whenever he gets a chance very well sir i will warn him that he will be wanted to-morrow there can be no harm in trying him for once anyhow there was some little surprise among the men who played cricket at hearing that trumpeter smith was to play in the eleven against the rifles and some little grumbling among those who had hoped to be the next choice however all agreed that he was a very likely youngster the hussars won the toss and went in first the bowling of the rifles was deadly and the ten wickets fell for fifty-two runs edgar was the last to go in and did not receive a single ball his partner succumbing to the very first ball bowled after edgar had gone out to the wicket then the rifles went in and the loss of the hussar's fast bowler soon made itself felt two of the best bats of the rifles were at the wicket and in spite of several changes of bowling seventy-four runs were scored without a separation being made captain moffat looked round the field despairingly he had tried all the men on whom he had any dependence his own bowling had been very severely punished and he had retired when thirty runs had been scored and was reluctant to take the ball again as he was standing undecided after an over in which twelve runs had been scored his eye fell on edgar as he ran lightly across to take up his place on the opposite side smith edgar ran up to him do you bowl at all i have not bowled this season sir but i used to bowl pretty fairly very well then take the ball at this end after the next over i am going to try smith at this end he said to the young lieutenant who was long stop he shrugged his shoulders well there is one thing he cannot make a worse mess of it than we are already making when the over was concluded edgar took the ball the year that had elapsed since he had last played and the gymnastics and hard exercise had strengthened his muscles greatly and as he tossed the ball from hand to hand while the field took their places he felt that he was more master of it than he had been before he had then been a remarkably fast bowler for his age and would have been in the eleven had it not happened that it already possessed three unusually good bowlers 
the first ball he sent up was a comparatively slow one he wanted to try his hand it was dead on the wicket and was blocked then he drew his breath and sent the next ball in with all his force a shout rose from the hussars as two of the wickets went flying into the air another player came out but at the fourth ball of the over his middle stump was leveled what do you think of that langley captain moffat asked the long stop as they walked together to the other end we have found a treasure he bowls about as fast as any one i have ever seen and every ball is dead on the wicket he is first class the lieutenant who was an old etonian said i wonder where he learnt to play cricket the wickets fell fast and the innings concluded for ninety-eight edgar taking seven wickets for twelve runs captain moffat put him in third in the second innings and he scored twenty-four before he was caught out the total score of the innings amounting to one hundred twenty-six the rifles had therefore eighty-one runs to get to win they only succeeded in making seventy-six eight of them being either bowled out by edgar or caught off his bowling after this he took his place regularly in the hussar team and it was generally acknowledged that it was owing to his bowling that the regiment that season stood at the head of the aldershot teams End of chapter five chapter six of dash for khartoum this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. Dash for Khartoum by George Alfred Henty. Chapter 6. Egypt. Naturally, his prowess at cricket made Trumpeter Smith a popular figure in the regiment, and even at the officers' mess his name was frequently mentioned, and many guesses were ventured as to who he was and what school he came from that he was a gentleman by birth nobody doubted there was nothing unusual in that for all the cavalry regiments contain a considerable number of gentlemen in their ranks men of this class generally enlisting in the cavalry in preference to the other arms of the service it was however unusual for one to enlist at edgar's age many young men after having failed to gain a commission by competition enlist in hopes of working up to one through the ranks another class are the men who having got into scraps of one kind or another run through their money and tired out their friends finally enlist as the only thing open to them the first class are among the steadiest men in the regiment and speedily work their way up among the non-commissioned officers the second class are on the other hand among the wildest and least reputable men in the ranks they are good men in a campaign where pluck and endurance and high spirits are most valuable but among the worst and most troublesome when there is little to do and time hangs heavily on hand there were two of the sergeants who had failed in the examination for commissions and were hoping some day to obtain them one had been five years in the regiment the other three their attention had first been called to edgar by his getting a first class in the examination which at once stamped him as having had an education greatly superior to that of the majority of recruits his position in the regimental cricket team further attracted their attention and they took an opportunity to speak to him when it happened they were walking together and met edgar returning from an afternoon's ramble across the country well smith how do you like soldiering i like it very well i don't think that there is anything to complain of at all it is better than grinding away at latin and greek and mathematics and that sort of thing the younger of the two sergeants said with a smile there are advantages both ways sergeant so there are lad of the two i like drill better than grinding at books worse luck if i had been fond of books i should not be wearing these stripes i asked the bandmaster if you were learning an instrument he said you were not so i suppose you mean to give up your trumpet and join the ranks as soon as you get to eighteen 
Yes, I should not care about being in the band. Your cricket is not a bad thing for you, the elder of the two men said. It brings you into notice and will help you to get your stripes earlier than you otherwise would do. As a man who does his regiment credit, either as a good shot or as a cricketer, or in the sports, is sure to attract notice and to be pushed on if he is steady and a smart soldier. If you won't mind my giving you a bit of advice, I should say don't try to push yourself forward. Sometimes young fellows spoil their chances by doing so. Some of the old non-commissioned officers feel a bit jealous when they see a youngster likely to make his way up, and you know they can make it very hot for a fellow if they like. So be careful not to give them a chance. Even if you are blown up when you do not deserve it, it is better to hold your tongue than to kick against it. Cheeking a non-commissioned officer never pays. Thank you, Sergeant, Edgar said quietly. I am much obliged to you for your advice. An uncommonly good style of young fellow, Sergeant Netherton, who was the son of a colonel in the army and had been educated at Harrow, said to his companion, Comes from a good school, I should say. Must have got into some baddish scrape or he never would be here at his age. It does not quite follow, the other replied. His father may have died, or burst up somehow, and seeing nothing before him but a place at a clerk's desk, or enlisting, he may have taken this alternative, and not a bad choice either, for putting aside altogether the chance of getting a commission, which is a pretty slight one, there is no pleasanter life for a steady, well-conducted young fellow who has had a fair education, than the army. He is sure of getting his stripes in a couple of years after enlisting. A non-commissioned officer has enough pay to live comfortably. He has no care or anxiety of any sort. He has more time to himself than a man in any other sort of business. There are no end of staff appointments open to him if he writes a good hand and does not mind clerk work. If he goes in for long service, he has every chance of being regimental sergeant major before he has done, and can leave the service with a pension sufficient to keep him in a quiet way. Yes, that is all very well, Summers, but he cannot marry. That is to say, if he has, as we are supposing, been born and educated as a gentleman, he cannot marry the sort of woman he would like as a wife. No, there is that drawback, the other laughed. But then, you see, if he had been obliged to take a small clerkship leading to nothing, he could hardly invite a young countess to share it with him. As Edgar walked back to barracks, he thought over the advice that had been given him, and recognized its value. He knew that the chances of his ever obtaining a commission were exceedingly small, and that even young men whose fathers were officers of high standing and considerable influence seldom obtain a commission under six or seven years' service, and that the majority of commissions from the ranks are given to old non-commissioned officers who were made quartermasters or paymasters. He had not entered the service, as had the two non-commissioned officers with whom he had been speaking, for the express purpose of gaining a commission, but simply because he had always had a fancy for soldiering, and because it seemed at the time he left Cheltenham the only thing open to him. He had resolved from the first that he would regularly put by a portion of his pay, so that he could at any time purchase his discharge if he wished to, should he see any opening in which he could embark by the time he reached the age of three or four and twenty. He would have gained experience, and might then, if he liked, emigrate to one of the colonies. He resolved that when winter came he would go into one of the regimental workshops and learn a trade, either saddlery or farriery, which would enable him to earn his living for a time abroad until he saw something better to do. At school Edgar had held his place rather by steady work than by natural talent. Rupert was the more clever of the two, but Edgar's dogged perseverance had placed him in a more advanced position on the modern side than Rupert held on the classical, and in whatever position he might find himself, his perseverance, power of work, and strong common sense were likely to carry him through. 
edgar was conscious himself that he had acted hastily and wrongly in leaving cheltenham as he had done and yet he felt that if again placed in the same circumstances he should do the same captain clinton had certainly a right to have a voice in his future and yet he felt so keenly the dishonour of the fraud in which he had been an unconscious accomplice that he could not have brought himself to accept any assistance at captain clinton's hands still he knew that those at home for he still thought of it as home would be feeling much anxiety about him and once a month he wrote a short letter to captain clinton saying that he was well and was keeping himself comfortably these letters he gave in charge of comrades going up for a day's leave to london to post there for him one day edgar had gone with a dozen others to bathe in the canal after doing so they had returned to barracks and he had gone for a walk by himself on his return he was walking along a lane at a distance of about a mile from the town when he heard a scream he at once started off at the top of his speed and at a turn of the lane he came upon a group of two tramps and two frightened ladies one of these was in the act of handing over her purse to a tramp while the second man was holding the other by the wrist and was endeavouring to tear off her watch and chain which she was struggling to retain just as edgar turned the corner he struck her on the face and she fell backward on to the bank another moment and edgar was up to them the tramp turned with a savage oath edgar who was carrying his riding whip struck him with it with all his strength across the eyes and the man staggered back with a shriek of pain the other stood on the defensive but he was no match for edgar who was in hard exercise and in regular practice with the gloves and whose blood was thoroughly up the fight lasted but a minute at the end of which time the tramp was lying in the road roaring for mercy and shouting to his comrade to come to his assistance the latter however was stamping with pain and was still unable to use his eyes edgar turned to the ladies if you will kindly walk on to the town he said and send the first man you meet here to me i will take care of these two fellows until he arrives and then we will hand them over to the police do not be alarmed he went on seeing that they hesitated i think they have had enough of it the ladies hurried off and before going many hundred yards came upon three infantry men who when they heard what had happened set off at a run to edgar's assistance they arrived just in time the man on the ground had recovered his feet and he and his companion had attacked edgar with fury and it needed all the latter's skill and activity to defend himself as soon as the soldiers arrived upon the scene the combat ceased as a measure of precaution the tramps were first knocked down they were then dragged on to their feet and conducted by their captors into aldershot where they were lodged at the police station they were followed by the two ladies who after sending on the soldiers had waited until their return with the tramps they waited outside the police station until a constable came out and asked them to sign the charge sheet which they did edgar now looked at them fairly for the first time and recognized one of them as being the wife of the major of his corps you belong to my husband's regiment she said as they came out from the police station what is your name smith madam i am a trumpeter in d troop oh yes i remember your face now i have often seen you in the cricket field miss pearson and myself are greatly indebted to you i should not mind so much being robbed of my purse but i prize my watch very highly as it was a present from my father major horsley will see you and thank you when he hears what you have done i do not want any thanks edgar said it is a pleasure to punish such ruffians half an hour later major horsley came across to edgar's quarters and the sergeant called the lad down i am greatly indebted to you smith he said as edgar saluted greatly indebted to you you have behaved most gallantly and have saved my wife from the loss of her watch and chain that she greatly valued and perhaps from serious ill-treatment from those ruffians as it was one of them struck her a very severe blow on the face i know enough of you lad to feel that i cannot offer you money for the service that you have rendered me 
but be assured that I shall not forget it, and that when it is in my power to do you a good turn, I will do so. Thank you, sir, Edgar said. I am very glad to have been of service. The major nodded kindly. Edgar saluted and turned away, well pleased at having made a friend who would have it in his power to be so useful to him, and still more pleased that the major had not offered him money as a reward for what he had done. An hour later he was sent for to the orderly room, where the colonel, in the presence of several of the officers, thanked him for his gallant conduct. "'You are a credit to the regiment, Smith, and you may be sure that I shall keep my eye on you,' he concluded. The next day the tramps were brought up before the local magistrates and committed for trial for highway robbery with violence, and a month later they were brought up at the Assizes at Winchester and sentenced to five years' penal servitude. Edgar gained a great deal of credit in the regiment from the affair, and came to be known by the nickname of the Bantam. There were, of course, some men who were jealous of the young trumpeter's popularity, and two or three of the non-commissioned officers especially felt aggrieved at the notice taken of him. One of these was the corporal in charge of the barrack room occupied by Edgar, for he had, since he had been regularly appointed to a troop, left the quarters he first occupied with the band for those allotted to Troop D. Corporals, however, have but little power in a barrack room. They are in a sort of transitional state between a private and a sergeant, and are liable for even a comparatively small fault to be sent down again into the ranks. This being the case, they seldom venture to make themselves obnoxious to the men who were but lately their comrades, and may be their comrades again before a week is out. Corporal North, however, lost no opportunity of making himself disagreeable in a small way to Edgar. More than that he could not venture upon, for the men would at once have taken the lad's part. The regiment had been for some little time first on the list for foreign service, and there was no surprise when the news ran round the barrack rooms that the order had come to prepare for embarkation. It was supposed that, as a matter of course, India would be their destination, but it was soon known that the regiment was for the present to be stationed in Egypt. Most of the men would rather have gone direct to India, where soldiers are better off and better cared for than elsewhere. Edgar, however, was pleased at the thought of seeing something of Egypt, and it seemed to him, too, that there was a chance of active service there. It seems to me, he said, talking it over with several of his chums, that sooner or later we must have some fighting in Egypt. I cannot understand how it is that some of the regiments there have not long ago been sent down to Suakim. We have smashed up the Egyptian army, and it seems to me that, as we are really masters of the place, we are bound to protect the natives from these savage tribes who are attacking them down on the Red Sea and up in the Sudan. The Egyptians always managed them well enough until we disbanded their army. If Hicks Pasha had had, as he asked for, an English regiment or two with him, he would never have been smashed up by the Mahdi's people, and it seems to me awful that the garrisons of Sinkat and Tokar should be deserted when we have a lot of troops lying idle at Cairo, while Baker is trying in vain to get up a native force to march to their relief. I wish, instead of going to Egypt, we were going straight down to Suakim to help him. There is one thing, if Baker fails and Sinkat and Tokar fall into the hands of the natives, there will be such indignation that government will have to do something. So I think there is a very good chance of our seeing some active service there, which will be a thousand times better than sweltering in hot barracks in Cairo. You are right, Smith, one of the others said. I don't go in for reading the papers, and I don't know anything about the chaps in Egypt, but if there is going to be a row, I say let us have our share in it. We are pretty well up in the pursuing drill. It would be a change to do it with somebody to pursue. Anyhow, wherever it is, it will be a good job to get out of Aldershot with its parades and its drills and its long valley and the whole blooming lot of it. Three days later the order came, 
and the regiment proceeded by rail to southampton they embarked as soon as they arrived there and the transport started on the following morning the weather was fine and the voyage a pleasant one they had but little to do for they had left their horses behind them as they were going to take over the horses of the regiment they were going to relieve the steamer was a fast one and in twelve days after sailing they reached alexandria they were met when they arrived there by terrible news general baker's force had marched to the relief of tokar but on the way had been attacked by the natives and utterly defeated half the force being killed and the whole would have been annihilated had they not reached the seashore where the guns of the vessels which had brought them down from suakim checked the pursuit of the enemy sinkat had fallen the news had arrived only on the previous day and the greatest excitement prevailed the regiment at once proceeded to cairo by train and took over the barracks and horses from the small detachment that had been left in charge of them the main body of the regiment having crossed them on their journey from alexandria as they were to proceed to india in the same steamer that had brought out the hussars they were scarcely settled in their quarters before they heard that now that it was too late an expedition was to be sent down to suakim two english regiments would have saved baker's force from destruction and would have rescued the garrisons of sinkat and tokar now a large force would have to be employed some time would of course be needed for the organization of the expedition and in the meantime the hussars had plenty of opportunity for investigating cairo to edgar the town was delightful with its bazaar and its varied population and he and some of his comrades were never tired of wandering about examining the shops with their curious contents their bright-colored scarves their wonderful pipes their gaudy brasswork and their oriental stuffs and carpets but the population were even more amusing with the mixture of egyptians arabs and negroes clad in every variety of garb from the egyptian functionary in his neat blue uniform and fez and the portly merchant in his oriental robes to the arabs muffled up in cotton cloths with turban and burnous the lightly clad fella and the women shrouded in dark blue cottons with their faces almost entirely hidden by the yashmak it needed some dexterity to avoid the strings of loaded camels that made their way through the narrow streets the porters carrying heavy weights hanging from the centre of a thick bamboo pole resting on the shoulders of two or four men and the diminutive donkeys with their high saddles on the top of which were perched men who looked far more capable of carrying the donkeys than the donkeys of supporting their weight the men soon discovered that spirits were cheap in cairo and the result was a considerable addition to the number brought up at the orderly room for drunkenness among these to edgar's satisfaction was corporal north who was at once sent back to the ranks and sentenced to a week in the cells on the day he came out edgar went up to him now look here north you have made it pretty hot for me while you were corporal if i had given you any cause for it i should bear no malice but it has simply been persecution as long as you were corporal i had to grin and bear it but now that you are in the ranks we can settle matters so i challenge you to meet me in the riding school after we are dismissed from parade to-day that will suit me exactly north said you want a licking badly young fellow and now you will get it well if i were you i would say nothing about it until it is over edgar replied for you see it is quite possible that it may be the other way as several of the men had heard the conversation there was a considerable gathering in the riding school after they were dismissed from parade the sympathies of the men were strongly with edgar but most of them thought that he was hardly a match for north who had fought several times before he had got his stripes and was a well-built young fellow of two-and-twenty the fight lasted upwards of an hour north had some knowledge of boxing but in this respect edgar was his superior he was far stronger and longer in the reach while edgar was the more active in the early part of the fight the advantage lay all with the soldier and edgar was terribly knocked about so much so that the general opinion was that he had better give in 
and say that he had had enough but edgar laughed at the suggestion we have only begun yet he said to the man who was acting as his second last tells in the long run i have seen that before now and i have double the last he has this was the fact edgar had been constantly at hard work since he joined the regiment while north had had a comparatively easy time of it since he became a corporal he had too spent no small portion of his pay in drink and although he was seldom absolutely drunk had had more than one narrow escape of his condition being observed on his return to barracks in the evening as the fight went on then want of condition told upon him edgar who had at one time seemed weak gradually recovered his strength while north became exhausted by the exertions he had made in the early part of the fight edgar now took the offensive and at the end of an hour and a quarter's fighting north was no longer able to come up to time and a loud shout from the lookers-on proclaimed that edgar was the victor he went across to north and held out his hand let us shake hands north he said it has been a good tough fight i owe you no malice now and if you get your stripes again as i dare say you will i hope it will be a lesson to you not to drop unfairly upon any one you may take a dislike to north took the hand held out to him you have licked me fairly smith he said i did not think you had it in you but i don't think you would have thrashed me if i had been in as good a condition as you are very likely not edgar laughed well next time we fight i hope it will be against the arabs and not against each other this fight greatly added to edgar's reputation in the regiment north was not a popular character and had always been considered a bully and the pluck with which edgar had continued the fight was thoroughly appreciated neither of the combatants were able to take their place in the ranks for some days after the fight being obliged to obtain an order from the surgeon dispensing them from appearing on parade though they still did stable duty and inner guards through the surgeon the matter came to the ears of the officers who by quiet inquiry from the sergeants learnt the particulars of the fight your friend trumpeter smith is reported as unfit for duty my dear major horsley said to his wife is he i am sorry for that the lady said is there anything we can do for him in the way of sending him some soup or anything of that sort he is not seriously ill i hope i am afraid he is beyond your skill emma major horsley said and then seeing that his wife looked seriously grieved went on don't be alarmed he has only been fighting again oh is that all i was afraid it was fever or something of that sort who has he been fighting with he doesn't look quarrelsome at all he has been fighting with a man named north who was a corporal in his troop and who as i hear has been persecuting him a good deal the fellow got drunk the other day and was reduced to the ranks and young smith lost no time in challenging him to fight i hear most of the men thought he was a fool for doing so for north is five years older than he is and a stiff-built young fellow too i hear that it was a very hard fight and lasted nearly an hour and a half after the first half hour it seemed to every one that smith would have to give in for the other man had all the best of it knocking him down every round but he stuck to it and at last north was so beaten he could not come up to time the sergeant says both of them are terribly knocked about smith worst he can hardly see out of his eyes and it will be fully a week before either of them can take their places in the ranks i hear it was the longest fight that there has been in the regiment for years and the sergeant major tells me the men are quite enthusiastic over the pluck with which the young one fought you see he is not seventeen yet and for a lad of that age to stand up against a man and one too who as i hear is accustomed to use his fists is a feather in his cap it will do him good in the regiment i have no doubt some of the men are rather jealous of the position he gained from his play at cricket and from that affair of yours it was very mean of them then mrs horsley said warmly perhaps so my dear but favorites are not often popular anyhow this will do him good 
and will give him a better standing in the regiment than even his cricket could do and at any rate those who don't like him are likely after this to keep their opinion to themselves i wish we could do something for him robert you see we have never done anything yet i shall have a chance of giving him a helping hand some day the major replied and you may be sure that when the opportunity comes i shall do what i can i have not forgotten what i owe him i can tell you the opportunity came sooner than the major had expected in a short time it became known that four squadrons of the tenth hussars and one squadron of the first were to accompany the expedition and the greatest excitement prevailed in the corps as to which troops should be chosen two days later edgar was delighted to hear that the a and d troops had been named for the service why have they chosen the d troop robert mrs horsley asked her husband partly my dear because atkinson is the senior captain oh yes i forgot that and what is the other reason well emma that reason is known only to myself but i do not mind your knowing it but you must not whisper it to any one what is it his wife asked curiously because my dear trumpeter smith belongs to that troop and i thought i would give him the chance of distinguishing himself some day when it comes to a question of promotion it will count in his favor that he has seen active service oh i am glad robert it was very good of you to think of it i wish that he could know that you thought of him that he certainly cannot know the major said decidedly it would be a nice thing for it to be known by any one that the arrangements as to which troops should go on service had been influenced by my desire to do a good turn to a trumpeter the other reason is a good and sufficient one atkinson as senior captain has almost a right to the first chance that offers he is pretty sure to get brevet rank if there is any hard fighting at this moment there was a knock at the door and an orderly entered and saluting handed a note to major horsley he glanced through it and an expression of pleasure crossed his face my compliments to the colonel i will come across and see him at once what is it robert his wife asked as the door closed behind the soldier well my dear it is news that i own gives me great pleasure but which i am afraid you won't like not that you are to go with the detachment robert yes emma that is it and he handed her the note my dear horsley i have just received orders from the general that a field officer is to go in command of the squadron as senior major you have of course the right to the chance i congratulate you mrs horsley turned a little pale as she read it and her lip quivered as she said well robert no doubt you are glad of the opportunity and as a soldier's wife i will not say anything to damp your pleasure it is natural that you should wish to go if i were a man i should wish so too anyhow it will only last a very short time you said you thought that they would be back again in a month and surely there can be no very great danger in a fight with these savages the smallest amount in the world emma it is not like baker's force which was composed of these cowardly egyptians and it is ridiculous to suppose that these wild tribesmen brave as they may be can stand against british troops armed with breech-loaders i am afraid that all our share of the business will be to do a little scouting before the fight begins and a little pursuing practice afterwards so there will be really no occasion whatever for you to be at all uneasy child and i must own that i am extremely glad of the opportunity of taking part in this little expedition against these fanatics well i must go across and see the colonel mrs horsley indulged in a quiet cry while he was away for although she did not apprehend any real danger the thought that her husband was going to run some risk of his life for the first time since she married him was a trial however she looked bright and cheerful when he returned and at once set to work to pack up the kit required for the expedition the next morning the detachment of the first hussars eighty strong marched down to the station with one hundred men of the tenth hussars they took train for suez here they found another two hundred and twenty-eight men of the tenth 
who had come on by an earlier train and the work of embarking the horses on board the steamer that was to take them down to suakim at once began it was continued until nightfall and recommenced again at daybreak for the operation of getting horses on board a ship and slinging them down into the hold is necessarily a slow one but by midday all was concluded the baggage on board and the troops in readiness for a start it was just sunset when the vessel steamed away from the wharf the troops on board joining in a hearty cheer as she started the ship was far more crowded than would have been the case had she been starting for a long voyage but the run down to suakim was so short that she was packed as full as she could hold having in addition to the troops a number of mules for the transport every one was in high spirits the change was a most welcome one after the monotony of barrack life in egypt and moreover all were burning to avenge the destruction of baker's force and the massacre of the brave little garrison of sinkat the voyage was a pleasant one after passing out of the gulf of suez with the lofty and rugged mountains of sinai with its red rocks and patches of verdure rising almost from the water's edge they entirely lost sight of land on the left on the right however ran a range of steep hills which became bolder and loftier as they made their way south when night again fell the engines were slowed down for it was not deemed advisable to arrive off suakim before daylight as the coast of the neighborhood abounded with reefs and the entrance to the harbor was intricate and difficult as soon as day broke the engines were again put at full speed and in an hour the masts of the shipping lying in the port could be made out as they neared the port a small launch was seen coming out an officer soon came on board you are to go down the coast to trinkitat he said to the captain the transports have gone down there that is to be the base of operations the officers clustered round the newcomer to learn the news you have been more lucky than the nineteenth he said the neva ran ashore on a shoal eighteen or nineteen miles away and has become a total wreck several steamers went out at once to help her and got out the men and horses a good deal of the baggage was lost and fifty transport mules which there was no time to take out before she went to pieces it was a very close thing and it was very lucky that aid came two or three hours after she struck there has been trouble with the black regiments the scoundrels mutinied as soon as they got on shore and announced their intention of joining the rebels so the marines have been kept here for the defense of the place instead of going with the expedition i am sorry to say that tokar has fallen a groan broke from his hearers it is a bad business he went on but happily there has been no repetition of the sinkat massacre we heard the news yesterday morning it was brought by five soldiers who made their way down the coast they reported that the civil governor of the town had entered into negotiations with the enemy and had agreed to surrender on the promise that the lives of the garrison should be spared in the afternoon two of our spies came back and confirmed the intelligence it seems that they could have held out some time longer and that the governor has behaved like a traitor they were annoyed by a distant fire from six croup guns taken at the defeat of baker's force and worked by some black artillerymen captured at the same time the fire did no material harm but it seems to have frightened what little courage was left among the officials and the governor and a hundred and fifty of the townsmen went out and arranged the surrender although they knew perfectly well that in a very few days help would arrive there is one thing the surrender will enable general graham to choose his own time and to wait until all the troops are up instead of pushing forward as he might otherwise have done directly he thought he had men enough to save tokar in another five minutes the officer had taken his place in the launch and was steaming back into suakim and the transport was making her way south by noon she was anchored off the landing-place a low beach with a flat country extending behind it the shore was alive with troops and numbers of boats were plying backwards and forwards the work of disembarking the horses began immediately 
and the greater part of them were on shore before night there they found the black watch gordon highlanders irish fusiliers nineteenth hussars and the mounted infantry a corps of one hundred and twenty-six strong edgar greatly enjoyed the bustle and excitement and the troops were all in the highest spirits the first comers were eagerly questioned they said that during the day the nineteenth and mounted infantry had made a reconnaissance across a lagoon which lay between the beach and the country behind the enemy had been seen there in force but they retired at once upon seeing the cavalry advance it was expected that by the following morning some of the infantry would cross the lagoon and occupy a battery which general baker had thrown up there to cover his landing for trinicut had been the spot from which he too had advanced to relieve tokar and the scene of the conflict in which his force had been destroyed would probably be crossed by the british in their advance no tents had been taken or were needed for even in february the heat upon the shores of the red sea is very great and as the evening went on the buzz of talk and laughter died out and the troops lay down and slept under the starry sky End of chapter six